Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Innal hamdalillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla la wa may yudlil fala hadiya la wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu ya ayyuhallazina amanu taqullaha haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun ya ayyuhan nas taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisaa وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا أَمَّا بَعْدُ Islam calls us to the highest ideals the most noble matters to the highest affairs as the Prophet said, Inna Allah Ta'ala yuhibbu ma'aliyat umur wa yakrahu safsafaha That verily Allah the Most High, He loves the highest affairs. Ma'aliyat umur, the highest character, the most noble affairs. Wa yakrahu safsafaha And He hates the silly trivial things of this life. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala loves to see the pursuit of the highest character, of the most noble matters of the most important affairs. And there is nothing more noble, more important than our pursuit of Jannah, our pursuit, our pursuit of paradise. There is no ambition higher than this. There is no competition, no competition more important than this. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about Jannah, He uses the language of competition in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, سَابِقُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ That you should Hasten, you should compete, you should race with one another. To what? To the forgiveness of your Lord. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ And go quickly, بِسْرَعَةٍ Go with haste, race and go quickly to the forgiveness of your Lord and to a paradise whose width is the heavens and the earth. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْتَبِقُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ Compete with one another in doing good deeds. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَزِ الْمُتَلَافِسُونَ Those who want to compete, don't compete for this dunya. Compete instead for the akhirah, for the next life. Those who want to compete, compete for the good things of the next world, not for the, the silly, trivial things of this world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just from the language in the Qur'an, Allah is teaching us that we must compete, that we must strive, we must have ambition for higher, more lofty things. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He describes the believers in different places in the Qur'an, in one place at the end of Surah Al-Furqan, when He starts listing the qualities of the believers, one of the things He says is, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَطُرْيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُنَا that, O oh, our Lord, they are the people, the believers are the people who make dua and they say, O oh, our Lord, make from our wives and from our children, the coolness of our eyes. In other words, when we look at them, we look at our wives, we look at our children, we feel peace. We feel contentment. We feel at, at home, at ease. They please us when we look at them. We don't have problems, we, are, we like to be with our families. They bring us peace and serenity. And then they go on to say, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imam." Make us imams for the righteous. What does that mean? That we should be the imam in the prayer? No. But it means to be an imam in action. The, the believers are the ones who make dua to Allah saying, make me a leader in action. In other words, a role model. That I lead by my example. That I do the good deeds and then the others see me and they follow my way. And the scholars of Tafsir, they said about this verse, وَفِي هَذِي الْآيَةِ that in this verse is proof that seeking to be a role model is obligatory on the believers. We don't get to choose. For the believers, they have to be, they should aspire to be role models for the other Muslims. That make me an imam in action so that the others see my example and then they follow my way. 
And this is why one of the scholars, Wahib ibn al-Ward, rahimahullah, he said, إِنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ أَن لَا يَسْبِقُقَ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَحَدٌ فَفَعَلْهُ That if it's possible for you, if you have that ability, if you have the capacity, that no one can outrace you in racing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to doing this, this race of good deeds, no one can go ahead of you. If you have that ability, then you must do so. If you can take first place in this race, then don't settle for second place. Don't settle for, don't settle for second place as a Muslim. If you know that you can be the best, if you know you are capable of more than what you are now. And likewise, the Prophet ﷺ also taught us to have high ambition, to always aim high, to not settle for anything less than the best. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهَ فَاسْأَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ When you ask Allah, when you make dua to Allah for Jannah, don't just make dua to Allah, oh Allah, let me enter Jannah. But ask for al-firdaus. Ask for the special area of Jannah called al-firdaus. What is al-firdaus? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, فَإِنَّهُ أَوْسَطُ jannah Because it is the middle part of Jannah. You know in Arabic, when the Arabs say something is the middle, that means that that thing is the best. When something is in the middle, it means that that thing is the best. That's why, for example, Quraysh, they were called Awsat al-Arab, the middle of the Arabs because they had the best lineage. Their lineage was considered the best amongst the different tribes. And likewise, in Surah Al-Qalam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the story of the people of the garden, and they were not given the sadaqah, and so on, it's the story is mentioned in the Quran. In the end, one of them reminds them that what they were doing was wrong. So Allah says, قَالَ أَوْسَطُهُمْ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكُمْ لَوْ لَا تُسَبِّحُونَ The one in the middle of them, meaning the best of them, said, didn't I tell you that we should give thanks to Allah for what we have? And likewise, the Arabs, they say, خَيْرُ الْأُمُورِ أَوْسَطُهَا The best of affairs are the ones in the middle, that don't go to one extreme or another extreme. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, الْفِرْدَوْسِ is also of Jannah, meaning what? It is the best part of Jannah. The middle part of Jannah meaning it is the best part of Jannah. Wa'ala al-Jannah, and it is the highest part of Jannah. You know, Jannah is levels. Levels. The ones who do more good deeds, they go higher and higher in the levels. So the highest part of Jannah is this section called Al-Firdaus. Wa fawqahu arshu rahman And above Al-Firdaus is nothing except the throne of Al-Rahman himself. There is no level higher than Al-Firdaus. The only thing above Al-Firdaus is the throne of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. وَمَنْ هُوْ تَفَجِّرُ أَنْهَارُ الْجَنَّةِ And from Al-Firdaus uh, uh, flow the, uh, spring forth the rivers of Jannah. And likewise, the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba, they understood these teachings and they lived their lives by these teachings. For them, their highest ambition was not to attain wealth or status or glory in this world, but it was only to attain the highest rewards, the highest levels in the next world. So once some, a group of the poor, the muhajireen, you know the muhajireen, who are the muhajireen? Muhajireen, when you say muhajireen, who are the muhajireen? One is emigrated from... The immigrants, the ones who made hijrah from Mecca to Medina. And many of these Muslims who made hijrah, from Mecca to Medina, they left everything behind. They left their homes. You cannot take your house with you. They left their homes. They left their wealth. They left their property. They left everything behind. They arrived in Medina penniless. They had nothing. So, some of them, like Abd rahman ibn Awf and uh, Abu Bakr and Uthman, they did business in Khalasi. They prospered. Everything they lost, they got it all back. But some of the others, who are muhajireen, they stayed poor in Medina. So, some of these poor muhajireen, they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they said, Ya Rasulullah, ذَهَبَ أَهْلَ الْدُثُورِ بِالدَّرَجَاتِ الْعُلَى وَالنَّعِيمِ الْمُقِيمِ Ya Rasulullah, the wealthy have gone away with the highest rewards and the highest stations. So the Prophet said, how is that? They said, يُصَلُّونَ كَمَا نُصَلِّي They pray like we pray. وَيَصُمُّونَ كَمَا نَصُمُّ And they fast like we fast. وَيَتَصَدَّقُونَ بِفُضُولِ أَمْوَارِهِمْ and then they give charity from all this wealth that they have. And then they free the slaves. Yani they take their wealth that they have and they use it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have no money. Yani we are the ones, we have nothing, we're penniless. Some of the Sahaba, yani they didn't even have two clothes. 
They used to, when it was time to pray, they'd have to borrow someone's clothes because they only had the izar, you know, the, the izar, the lungi. Literally, all they had is just the lungi. And when it was time to pray, they'd have to get somebody's uh, cloth to uh, a sheet to cover their upper body to make them pray. You know, they have nothing. So they said, we have nothing. They have all of this, and they are going ahead in this race. So they're not jealous that they have better clothes, or they have better food, or that they have better houses. This doesn't mean anything to them. They're only upset because they're going to have a higher station than Jannah. They will be able to do more with their wealth than we are able to do. So then the Prophet he said, Shall I not teach you something? That if you do it, you will catch up to those who have gone ahead of you. وَتَسْبِقُونَ بِهِ مَنْ بَعْدَكُمْ And you will go ahead of those who come after you. وَلَا يَكُونُ أَحَدٌ أَفْضَلَ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا مَنْ صَنْعَ مِثْلِ مَا سَرَعْتُمْ And no one will be better than you on the day of judgment. Except the one who does the same as this. They said, بَلَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Of course, tell us. What is this thing? Tell us what we do so we can get the advantage. He said, say subhanallah 33 times after every prayer. Say alhamdulillah 33 times. Say Allah 33 times. And then you complete the hundred with La ilaha illallah wahdu la sharika la lahu al-mulk wa la al-hamdu You make this dhikr after the prayer, this will be your sadaqah. This will be sadaqah for you. So they went away and they were so happy. They were so happy. Now they have something to also equalize with the wealthy. They have something that they can also give in charity so that they can also keep up in the race. But after some time they came back to the Prophet and they said, Ya Rasulullah, Samia ikhwanuna أَهْلُ الْأَمْوَالِ بِمَا فعلنا ففعلوا. They said, Ya Rasulullah, look what they said. They said, our brothers, the rich, they didn't hate them. They didn't envy them. They said, our brothers, the rich, they have heard about what we're doing. They see us making the dhikr. ففعلوا. Now they're doing the same thing. And if they saw us making the dhikr, now they're also making the dhikr. So now what do we do? So the Prophet he said, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُدِّهِ مَنْ يَشَاءَ this is the blessing of Allah. He gives it to whomever He was. This is the best I can do. Okay, khalas. What more can I do? This is the best I can do. And this competition in good deeds was not just limited to rich and poor, but even best friends. Even best friends amongst the Sahaba would compete with one another when it came to Jannah. So once the Prophet ﷺ, he called the Sahaba and asked for them to give donations, give sadaqah. So Umar al-Khattab, he went back home and he said, Today, if any day, I'm going to beat Abu Bakr. Every time they can beat Abu Bakr is always ahead. He's always the first to do something. He's always the one in the first, in the queue, when it comes to answering the call. Today, I'm going to beat Abu Bakr. So Umar al-Khattab, he gathered all his wealth, put it all together in a pile, divided it in half, and took half, and took it and presented it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when the Prophet saw this wealth, he said, Ya Umar, ماذا تركت لأهلك? What did you leave for your family? So Umar Khattab said, I left them half. Half I give for the sake of Allah, and half I leave for my family. And then Abu Bakr came. And he came and he brought all his wealth and left it and presented it before the Prophet So the Prophet asked him the same question. Ya Abu Bakr, ماذا تركت لأهلك? What did you leave for your family? So Abu Bakr, he said, I left them Allah and His Messenger. So when Umar Khattab heard this, he said, Wallahi, la usabiquka ba'da hadha abadan. He said, Wallahi, I will never try to compete with you after this. After this, now I realize Allah has favored you. He has given you a gift. He has blessed you with an ability He has not given me. Then no matter what the rest of the Sahaba do, Abu Bakr will always be going ahead. This competition and doing good deeds was not just limited to the rich and the poor, it was not just limited to best friends, but even relatives, even family members, even people who came from the same blood would compete with one another when it came to entering Jannah. So the Prophet ﷺ, before the Battle of Badr, he assembled an army to go and raid one of the caravans. And later on, this would be the Battle of Badr. And the Sahaba at the time, they didn't know it was going to be the Battle of Badr. Yeah, they, they thought it was just going to be another expedition. In any case, the Prophet ﷺ ordered for volunteers to join the army. So two people volunteered from the same house. Sa'ad ibn Khaytama and his father Khaytama. Sa'ad the son and Khaytama the father. They both said, we want to join the army. 
So when this news reached the Prophet ﷺ, he said, tell them that one of them can join and one of them stays with the family. And both of them should not join, one stays behind to look after the family. So Khaytaban, who heard this, he said to his son Sa'ad, if there's no choice except for one of us to stay behind, then you stay behind and you look after the women and the children. And khalas, you stay here and I'll go and make jihad. So Sa'ad ibn Khaytaban, he said to his father, Ya Abati, O my dear father, O my beloved father, لو كان غير الجنة لا آثرتك به If it was anything other than Jannah, I would have preferred you for it. If it was anything else, of course I wouldn't resist. I would say, you go first. But this is Jannah. This is paradise. So for this, I will not let anyone go ahead. So in the end, they had to draw lots. You know, draw lots, and who gets the shortest stick? And it was the lot of Sa'ad that was drawn. So he joined the army, and Khaytama stayed behind. And in the Battle of Badr, Sa'ad ibn Khaytama was one of those people who was a shaheed. He was from the shuhada. These are the men that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described when he said, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَهَدُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ That from amongst the believers are men. From amongst the believers are men who have been true to the covenant they have made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمَنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ So some of them have fulfilled the oath. وَمَنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظَرْ And some of them are still waiting. وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَفْدِيلًا But none of them changed their ways. They were always consistently obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those who have high ambition, there is no rest. You get no rest in this life. You are always exhausted. Once Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he was asked, مَتَى يَجِدُ الْعَبْدُ طَعْمَ الرَّاحَةً when does the slave of Allah get to take rest? He said, When you take that first step in Jannah, then you can take a rest. Then you can have a break. Until then, it's work. Non-stop work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The poet Al-Mutanabbi, he said, That when the souls are great, when they have great ambitions, high ambitions, they exhaust and wear out their bodies in pursuit of their goals. They wear out and exhaust their bodies in pursuit of their goals. One of the greatest scholars, Safwan ibn Salim, rahimallah, he used to worship Allah so much. They used to say when he would make Qiyam al-Layl, he would pray Qiyam so long that his shins, his legs would swell up. His students used to say about him, لو قيل له غدا القيام If it was said to him, tomorrow is the day of judgment. Tomorrow is the day of judgment. Get ready. That he would not be doing any more worship than he was already doing. In other words, he was already living his life as if tomorrow was the day of judgment. He was already pushing himself to the maximum. There was nothing more he could, all, he could do. He was already doing as much as, 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 as was possible for him. That high ambition in all their affairs. Whether it was worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or whether it was knowledge of Islam. And the people before us, they did not have just ambition to learn the Islamic sciences. But their ambition was to master all the sciences, to learn all the knowledge, to learn everything that's possible to learn. The scholars in the past were not just scholars of Quran or scholars of Hadith. They were scholars of every field. Because for them, all knowledge was something that they wanted to learn, something to be desired. Imam al-Bayruni, rahimahullah, he was not just a scholar of the Quran and the Sunnah, but he was an astronomer, he was a mathematician, he was a historian, he spoke five different languages. When he was on his deathbed, and he was in the last few moments of his life, one of the ulama came to visit. So al-Bayruni, he asked the scholar, Remember one day you were telling me about the shares of the maternal grandmother. You know the fara'id, the shares of inheritance. Some of the shares are mentioned in the Quran. Other shares are mentioned in the, uh, in the Sunnah and so on. Anyway, al bayruni said, you remember you were telling me the shares of the maternal grandmother. What were the shares again? So the scholar said, you want to ask me about this? Yeah, you're in this condition. You're about to leave this world. And you want to ask me about the small issue of fiqh. So al bayruni he said to him, is it not better that I leave this world knowing this affair than that I leave being ignorant of it? So the scholar told him to share it, taught him to share it, and then al Bayruni repeated it back to him. And the scholar got up and he left. And as he was walking down the street, 
he could hear the mourners announcing the death of Al-Bayruni, Rahimullah. Imam al-Shafi'i, everybody knows Imam al-Shafi'i is the great faqih, the great scholar of hadith and so on. But al-Shafi'i was not only a scholar of the Quran and the Sunnah, he was also a scholar of the Arabic language. He used to write his own poetry. Later on, he was, he was originally in Iraq and then later on he moved to Egypt. And when he moved to Egypt, to Cairo, some medical students, they came to him and they asked him some questions, some medical fatawa. And when he gave his answers and they saw how much Imam al-Shafi'i knew about medicine, about anatomy, about physiology, they said, fix for us a lecture every week where we can learn from you, benefit from you, learn what you know about medicine and anatomy and so on. So Imam al-Shafi'i, he went into a group of fuqaha who were waiting for him. And he said, and have these people left any time for you? Because above everything else, Imam al-Shafi'i is the great faqih, the great scholar of the law. Asad ibn al-Furat, Asad ibn al-Furat rahimullah, was a student of knowledge who was from, originally from Tunisia, from North Africa. Later on, he went to Medina, and he studied with Imam Malik. And he learned the fiqh, the madhab of Imam Malik. And he learned the, uh, the book of hadith from Imam Malik al-Muwatta. And then he traveled to Iraq. And he studied with the students of Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa had two chief students. Anyone know who they are? One is Abu Yusuf, Al-Qadi Abu Yusuf. The other one? Very good. Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. So Abu Hanifa passed away when Asad ibn Furat arrived. So he went to Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani. And he sat with him, sat in the class. And then later on after the class, he went to him and he said, I am a stranger in this land. I'm not from Iraq. And I will not be able to stay here long. I can only stay as long as my money lasts and then when it runs out, I have to leave. So what is the solution? What can I do? I don't have much time with you and I need to learn as much as I can from you. So Muhammad al-Hasan, he said, you sit with the Iraqis during the day. You sit with the other students during the day. And I will make the night exclusively for you. If you have the ambition, you really want to learn, خلاص, I will give the night for you, one-on-one, -on -one, dedicated time. So Asim Furad used to sit with the students in the day, and then at night he would go to Muhammad al-Hazm al-Shaybani's house. And then Muhammad al-Hazm would teach Asim Furad, the mother of Abu Hanif, and teach him the fiqh, teach him the hadith. And he would have a bucket of water next to him. So if Asad and Furat started getting drowsy, like some of the brothers here, started getting drowsy, started nodding off, Muhammad Hassan would take the water and throw it in his face. If you want to learn, if you're serious, then you have to sacrifice. You sleep later. Now is the time to work. So Al Asad and Furat, he said, فَكَانَ دَعْتُهُ وَدَعْتُهُ So this was his way, this was my way. Until finally he learned what he wanted to learn, he had achieved his goal, and then he left and returned back to Qayrawan, back to Tunisia. And when he returned back to Tunisia, he became a qadi, a judge. And he wrote a book called Al-Asadiyya. Al-Asadiyya in which he collected the different fiqh rules that he had learned from Imam Malik. And after that, the governor of Tunisia selected Asad al-Furat to be the commander of the army that would go and invade Sicily. You know, Sicily, this part of Italy, the Muslims ruled it for 150 years. But the one who led that expedition led the campaign in Sicily was Asad ibn al-Furat. And he's not buried in Tunisia. He's buried in Sicily. His grave is in Sicily facing the enemy. And even when the Muslims in the past achieved great things, they didn't settle for, that, for, they didn't settle for, what their, for their achievements, but they only aimed for higher objectives. Their ambitions rose higher and higher. Even when they achieved the greatest goals in this world, still their ambitions rose higher. Once, Salahuddin Ayyubi, he was riding along the coast, and his bio biographer, Bahauddin, was riding along with him with his uh, entourage, with his uh, group. And Bahauddin said it was a windy, stormy day, and the waves of the sea were rising and crashing so hard because of the storm. And I looked at the waves and I thought, who would be mad enough, crazy enough to go on a ship and sail in this kind of weather? So while I was in this state and I was riding with Salah Hadid, and this is after Salah Hadid Ayyubi had conquered, had liberated Palestine. He had now liberated 
uh, sorry, he had liberated uh, Jerusalem. He has now liberated Jerusalem, and the Muslims are again praying in Masjid al Aqsa. After this, they are riding along the coast, and Salah al Din says to Baha'uddin, I think that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants me victory over the rest of Palestine, then I will divide my territories. I will make a will stating my wishes, and then I will set sail on this sea, and I will pursue the Franks in their far off land, and pursue the Europeans. I will go to Europe and pursue the Franks in their far off lands, so as to free the earth of anyone who disbelieves in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or die in the attempt. And Salah al Ayyubi has freed Jerusalem, and he's not content with this. He wants to pursue the enemy back to France, back to Germany, to fight them in their countries, just as they invaded the Muslims in their country. So that he frees the earth of disbelief, or he dies in the attempt. And now here we are today. We are now living the dream of Salah al Ayyubi. We are the ones now who have the chance to remove disbelief from this place. Not with the strength of our swords, but with the strength of our character, with the nobility of our ambitions. Today, the Muslims of the world, we have largely forgotten our noble ambitions. We have forgotten our lofty <coughs> ideals, and the other nations of the world have taken our place. And so we are left on the sidelines to watch as they make decisions that affect us. But it's not enough for us to just tell stories of the past. It's not enough just to recite the glories of our past, the achievements of our greatest heroes. We must also write the story of the future. We must be the ones who are calling the people to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. To peace, to justice, to the truth. We were a great people once. Now it's time for us to be great once again. And that begins by having great objectives, great ambitions. Because if you cannot dream of being anything great, then you will never achieve anything great. If you cannot even conceive of being something extraordinary, then you will always be something ordinary. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to be those who have not only high ambitions, but help them help achieve those ambitions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our sins, to enter us into paradise and to save us from the hellfire. Ameen. <laughs> Any questions from, from the brothers related to the topic? First, what about the negotiations? Hold on. What time did you say is the best time to step in, like in terms of uh, the blessings, like, like the degree of the project? Or, uh, you mean the time of the day? Yeah, yeah to study or. Mm -hmm. Like the time where you're most efficient? Uh, definitely, obviously, the time after Fajr is a recommended time. And likewise, um, before Fajr, um, in the last hours of the night, uh, either you make Qiyam and or many scholars used to uh, seek knowledge and so on. In general, when you look at the Ulama in the past, they would spend their, their time uh, studying late in the night. They would spend the, because in the day they're busy with either their judges plot, or they're teaching the students, or they're learning from the teachers. So they're busy in the day. So normally at night they're spending the time uh, reading the Qur'an, uh, thinking about the Qur'an, meditating on it, reading the other books, the hadith, and so on. Um, as one of the scholars, he said, um, uh, when they said, how did you get the knowledge? He said, بِالسَّفَرِ وَالسَّحَرِ Forget the third, but with traveling and with uh, staying up late at night, and there was a uh, the third I don't remember. But uh, anyway, the point is that many ulama they would stay at night. As as for nowadays, you have to find the time that's best for you. So, um, for example, if you are on the train going to like London, you go somewhere else, you know, you're commuting. That's the time. Maybe you're, you're free. You don't have distractions. You can use that time. If you're up in the morning or you're up late at night, plus if that's if whatever works for you, you use that time effectively. Because there's no point saying uh, I'll study at night, and then by the end of the night, you know, by the end of the day, you're exhausted, you're tired from work, so you open the book, and then you're in five minutes, you're out. It doesn't matter about how much barakah there is at the time. That time doesn't work for you. 
So every person has to uh, look and see what's, the, what's best for them. What I'll say is there's two things. One is that nobody gets two hours now a day to sit and study. That doesn't happen anymore. So you get five minutes here, 10 minutes here, 20 minutes here. You take those minutes, you steal those minutes and use those, invest those in knowledge. So for example, you're calling, you know, you have a bill to pay, you're on the phone, they put you on hold, or you're calling the council, you're one of these things, they put you on hold 15, 20 minutes. Don't just sit there listening to the music for 20 minutes. And he put the phone on speaker and open a book, memorize, you know, memorize some Quran or read some hadith, whatever it may be. Don't waste the time. You understand? If you're in a queue, don't waste the time just standing in a queue. There, the Quran, do something. So you have to use the, the minutes you have waiting here, uh, you know, waiting for something else here. Use that time and invest it. So you take five minutes here, five minutes there, and that's an hour, two hours, and so on, you put it all together. So whatever works for everyone, that's the first point. Second point is that whatever it may be, though, Everyone should spend some time learning knowledge. There's no excuse, no excuse for people spending even a small portion of the day learning something from the Quran. There's no excuse. Everyone has 24 hours. The Sahaba had 24 hours. They didn't have 30 hours in the day. They had 24 hours just like us. So if it means you have to carve out some of your sleep, you sleep half an hour less. Take the half an hour invested in your akhirah. If it means you need to, how can it be you can make time to go to the gym? You can't make time to memorize the Quran. This is something I, you have the wrong ambition. Your priorities are not correct. So if people can make time for their food, they make time for the bathroom, they make time to bathe, surely they can make time to memorize and, and study the, the Quran. So everyone, it doesn't have to be a lot, but everyone should spend 5, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that each day, trying to do something. I know one person, he memorized Surah Al-Baqarah from the time he used to be stuck in traffic. And he's driving, this is in Riyadh. Riyadh, if you've ever been in Riyadh, traffic is horrible, horrendous, horrible traffic. So sometimes you get, if you're in the wrong section of town, uh, each light, you can be stuck at the light for 10, 15 minutes. And then the light turns green and everyone cuts in front of you so you don't move. Then the light turns red again, and you're in the same place. So he would just open the Quran, he had the Quran in his car, open the Quran, memorize a page each day. After, you know, only a month, two months, let's memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. It's not impossible. So for those who have high ambition, it's easy, Annie. Easy for the one who is determined. Clear? Anyone else? In terms of those high ambition you mentioned, what advice would you recommend for newly reverted people and people that are just coming back to practicing? In terms of studying. No, not in terms of studying, you try to um, consolidate your mind. Prayers, trying to um, <clears throat> the company of um, Muslims. Okay, the first thing, first thing is that uh, there's nothing more important than the prayer. So everyone has to be focused uh, on their prayers, and there's no excuse for uh, missing the prayers. Everyone should be praying, making their prayers uh, five times a day. If it's possible, everyone should make an effort. I don't know about running out on the situation here. Apparently, you, you have. Uh, yeah, you have the sajid. so I don't know you know uh, the details about that but if you can at least make it to the masjid at least once a day at least for fajr or for isha you should do your best to do that obviously there's sometimes you know everyone has different situations and so on but if it's possible you know to try to at least catch fajr in the masjid uh, this is something I would I would highly recommend or isha at least at least always have some daily connection with the masjid Try not, uh, try to not have a day pass except that you're at least visiting the masjid because this will not only give you reward for the prayer, but it, uh, especially for any you know, new brothers or people coming in new to the community, gives you a chance to meet other brothers. They will give you support. Uh, they can they will help you in, in not just in terms of your religion but also in your uh, affairs and so on. Because uh, everyone needs, yani, we're human beings. We are social animals. We need each other. We're not hermits. So everyone needs to. Uh, you know, come together and meet each other and support one another. This is uh, human nature. And this is one of the things Imam al-Sharafi, he said that one of the delights of this world is meeting the good Muslim brothers. Yani he said, if it wasn't for Qiyam al-Layl and meeting the Muslim brothers, then th there's no joy in this dunya for me. So meeting the Muslim brothers, meeting your brothers at the masjid and so on, this is one of the, uh, yani one of the joys of this life. So everyone should try their best to be very keen on the prayer, make sure you're praying uh, on time. Uh, and likewise, if you can, try to at least 
come to the masjid, if not every day, then every two days or something, uh, be connected to the masjid. If somebody is doing that, and they're connected to the masjid and meeting the brothers and so on, then hopefully this will lead on to the other things. Then you'll be able to come to the classes. Again, I don't know the situation here, but if there are classes in the masjid, uh, you can attend classes, learn, uh, learn things there. But it's a journey. It's not something that you will not be, uh, cannot change overnight. And each day a Muslim is focused on just trying to do, trying to improve just a little bit more. So you do, you know a little bit more than you did the day before. You've done, you do a little bit more than you were doing yesterday. So if a Muslim is working this way, just making small incremental steps, then at the end of a year, two years, five years, ten years, you will be a completely different person than where you are today. The problem with many Muslims today is, yani khas, yani don't move. We are on the treadmill. We're getting older and older and older, we're not making any progress. Mm -hmm. The wheel is like the mouse on the uh, treadmill, just going like this, and then khas, one day it's finished. So everyone should be focused, even if it's small steps, at, last, at, at least we're moving forward. So keep, yani be very keen on the prayer, make sure you're praying on time. Number two, keep a connection to the masjid, and then hopefully inshallah ta'ala, by keeping close to the masjid, this will enable the brothers to uh, you know, find classes, find avenues to learn more and develop more and so on. How do you sort of instill that love for the prayer into someone who's sort of not interested in praying? Like, you know, you got Muslims out there, they're not, they're not praying. Just so are you saying in terms of explaining it to someone else or to your own self? Yeah, yourself or if you know someone, like you might have a colleague, a friend, someone who you know is Muslim who don't pray nothing. You know, how do you get them to come to the mosque and... In terms of, first of all, for ourselves, yeah, you, everyone should realize the, uh, yeah, the importance of the prayer. Um, I mean, there is, a, there is a khilaf amongst the scholars about the one who doesn't pray, is he even a Muslim or not? We're not going to get into the details now, but the point is that many ulama took take the view that if someone's not praying five times a day, he's left Islam, he's not even a Muslim. He might as well be a, you know, a Jew or a Christian. So, there's another view as well, but my, my point is that it's something very serious, not, uh, it's not something trivial, it's not something optional. So, uh, everyone here at least should, should realize that this is something uh, serious and uh, should not be taken uh, lightly. As for making da'wah to, which is, we know, man, in the majority of Muslims, unfortunately, they don't pray. And, Allah uh, uh, I mean, we can only complain to Allah and make dua to Allah that He guides the, the Ummah. <coughs> what I would say is, you know, uh, everyone should be focused on his own. Um, you know, they have, uh, it's called the um, circle of uh, change and circle of influence. So you have, you know, the, or sorry, circle of concern and circle of influence. So, you know, there are things maybe you're concerned about, like we're concerned about the Muslims in Yemen. We're concerned about the Muslims in Iraq or Syria and so on. So we are concerned about those people. But there's not much we can do for them, except make dua. We don't know, I mean, we're not, we're not in Baghdad. We're not in Yemen. We can't do anything for those people, other than dua. But, so they're in our circle of concern. We're concerned about them, but we can't do much to, to influence things there. However, things in Reading, people in Reading, we can influence things here greatly, right? Here we can reach people, we can speak to them, we can talk to them. So, many Muslims today, unfortunately, we are so concerned with the things in our circle of concern and forget about the things in our circle of influence. You have Muslims who are more concerned about Palestine than they are about the streets of Reading. So everyone should have their priorities correct. Everyone should be focused on, number one, your own family, your own house, making da'wah to them and so on. But then also the, the people you interact with, Muslims at work, your classmates and so on. Be focused on them <coughs> and um, you know, spend more time thinking about them and making da'wah them, as opposed to, obviously we're still concerned about Muslims in other parts of the world, but what I'm saying is, you don't ignore Reading, mm -hmm. thinking only about Palestine, right? You don't march for Syria and then you do nothing about Reading, that doesn't make any sense. So as for the, the Muslims here, the Muslims you interact with, everybody has to, again, this is something that is, um, and it's not black and white, it's customized to the person. So, if the person, yeah, you, you know him well, and uh, he trusts you and so on, then you, when, you, when, you, when you pray, you say, why don't you come and pray with me? And he'll say, oh, you know, he'll make an excuse and say, come on, it's all right, you just, one time, it's not, a, not gonna kill you, why don't you come and pray? Every Muslim knows that he should pray. So it's not a case they don't know. 
Everyone knows. It's just laziness most times. If it's not laziness, if it's something more serious, like the brother says, no, I don't have to pray. Uh, it's not fard me to pray. Well, then this is a different issue. But this is the minority. Most Muslims, they know very well. They have to pray and they just say, Allah is the most merciful, He will forgive and I'm too lazy, basically. Even if He doesn't say it, this is the real the reality. I'm just too lazy to do it. So, you know, you, know, you try to uh, gently nudge him, say, why don't you pray with me? Or you're at school, why don't you come and you know, we pray the together, pray asa together and so on. Uh, then, you know, if that works or it doesn't work, then you can try maybe giving him some lectures, send, find some things that are beneficial. Uh, send, they say, I found, you know, I found this thing, I benefited a lot. Why don't you listen to it? Why don't you take a look? Uh, see if he, uh, you know, listens to it and likes it and so on. Uh, and then, you know, you, you find different ways, depending on how the other person is. If it's the case that the person doesn't respect you, though, if he says, and who are you to preach to me? I know what you used to do in the past, and you did this and this, so you are, you're, not, you're not some holy man now to tell me these things. If he's not going to take it from you, don't uh, just go and, again, find, uh, find someone else, find a video or, or a lecture or something, share it with the brother, and you know, make dua for him. You make dua, Allah, guide this person, and so on. The last thing you want to do, though, is don't ever look down on your nose at these people. Okay. For two reasons. One is that, first of all, they will obviously, if you are arrogant with these people, this is not going to. If you say, "Yeah, you should pray," don't you know you should pray? You want you want to go to the hellfire? You want to get? Who's going to respond to this kind of down? No one's going to respond to this thing. Most people, I don't think, will. So it should be done with wisdom, wisdom and gentleness and so on. And the other thing is that, you know. I hate to say it, but uh, don't know what can happen to you. Yani, we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us firm. Uh, just as we are here together worshipping Him and trying to serve Him, that hopefully at the, by the end of our lives we're also on the straight path and trying to be good Muslims. There are many cases where there were people who were practicing and praying and so on, and then at the end uh, they changed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, yani, left them because they were not sincere. So, no one should be arrogant to say, yani, khalas, yani, I'm guided, you are misguided. You never know, the tables might be turned. And he may be the one that enters paradise because Allah will give him hidayah at the end. You may be the one that enters the hellfire. And this is the hadith of the Prophet that uh, one of you can do good deeds, can do the deeds of Ahlul Jannah. Until there is nothing between him and paradise except an arms link. Yani, khalas, he just has to reach out and he can open the door. Uh, <coughs> but then the decree of Allah comes and he, because he was decreed for the people of the hellfire, he, he changes and he enters the hellfire and vice versa. So anyway, yeah, yeah, bottom line is that you try to make da'wah as best you can, you tailor it to the person, but always with gentleness, be patient, and you try to do it the, the best way possible. Clear?